Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Hard Truth Inside the Football Industry podcast with me, Philip Heidson, and El Presidente, Darren McAnthony, um, co-owner of English League One side, Peterborough United. And uh, let's go back. Uh, you know, I think you're in a better mood this time around than you were last week. You got a couple of wins under your belt since we last yeah, talked. Yeah. yeah, but to be fair, I mean... I, I was I miserable in those podcasts. I mean, I, 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 I don't I, think so. But you know, defeats still breed. You know. Yes, yeah. they do. I mean, listen. I, I kind of, as much as I might have been angry, I was still optimistic that we'd kind of, you know, get our act together. But look, we haven't got our act together yet. We've had a couple of good wins, and I think we talk about the EFL trophy and what are the uses of the EFL trophy to academies and whatever else. Well, the EFL trophy actually played a blinder in allowing us to win our league game because. You know, I've been speaking for a couple of weeks about our manager being brave, playing some of the young players. Both our fullbacks are injured, so you go to the next tier and they're youngsters. And he was kind of a bit maybe uneasy about that based on watching reserve games. He thought, well, maybe it's too much pressure. But finally, I think he watched them on Tuesday and they played so well, these young players. That EFL trophy game gave him the confidence, never mind the players, to go, you know what? We need that in our team. We need a bit of youthful exuberance. We need a bit of energy. We need players who are a little bit fearless, who, you know, haven't been struck down with defeats. And they were brilliant on Tuesday. And he put three of them in the team for Saturday. And they were probably our three best players next to Johnson Clark Harris scoring a hat trick, you know. And, you know, we, it's really funny because I, I'd spent the week studying data and giving the gaffer insights into the data vehicle, you know, I have as regards to, you know, we were bottom in the league for crosses. You know, amazingly, even though we were top mm-hmm. of the league during the season, we, you know, we're not we're playing with wing backs. We're not getting the ball in the box. And, yeah. you, you know, Clark Harris, God love him, was brought in for that service and to get that service. And, you know, there were so many things we weren't doing great and they were easy to pinpoint. And what I always do is I gave him five things we're doing brilliantly to show the players and five things we're not doing very well. And if we change those five things, we're not doing very well by 20, 30 percent. We'd be like lift off. And I think the key was the gaffer in his head was, I think he'd said to the players, look, you have to get crosses into the box. You have to get into the opposition's penalty area more. You have to have more shots on goal. That's how we play. We have to play in the front foot. And I think our start shocked the Rochdale manager even because we're not usually a very, our intensity levels aren't high when we start games. Mm -hmm. We score a lot of second half goals, but from the get-go, and I think a lot of fans looked at the team and thought, Jesus, you know, you got like no three youth team academy players in the team. You've just lost five out of six. What 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 the fuck are you doing? But what they brought was, as I said to you, was fearlessness. And sometimes young players, you give them instructions and they to the latter. And probably his instructions to the wide players were get balls in the box. Yeah. Well, f- well, fuck me. It was raining crosses. Do you know what mm-hmm. I mean? For the first half an hour, it, we were getting balls in the box left, right, and center. We were winning corners. We haven't scored two headers in the game probably since the old king died. And you know, we had two headers by the thirty fifth minute. And what was really good was. The experienced players suddenly came to life, yeah. played with confidence. We conceded the stupid goal for the equaliser, but that was really Rochdale's only chance of the game because right afterwards we scored again, like bang, bang, bang. Clark Harris had a hat-trick in 20 minutes. Yeah. And no word of a lie, it could have been 10 in the second half. So, look, we've got a tough game tomorrow night against MK Dons, but we've got to be brave. And we've lost Nathan Thompson. And that might mean a 17-year-old, you know, young Ronnie, if the manager plays him, coming in instead of Nathan. And some would say, Jesus, that's a that's a big call, you know, against a good team that likes to keep possession, that likes to attack, very good statistically, data-wise. But you know what? I'd rather he made a mistake than somebody maybe who's not going to be with us next yeah. year. So yeah. we have we have to blood them. And I said this for a few weeks. You don't have to put five in a minute once. But we know we've got a really good batch of young players. Put a couple in. You've got nine first-team players with them. They help them. You put four or five in, you can bury them. So that on Saturday with two or three of them in there was brilliant. And, and what really was good was Sammy Smoddock, you know, was out of the team and a 17-year-old took his place. But the biggest credit I can give to Smoddock was he came on on the hour mark and he was brilliant. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of players can sulk and he's not like that. He, he's a man and he'll come back. And I still think he's going to score 10, 15 goals this season. And he came on, he didn't let his chin drop and he, he gave it everything. Mo Issa, credit to him. Last two games, he's been reinvigorated. He's pressing, he's pushing, he's doing all the things he didn't do early in the season. So the subs really came on and played a part, which is what you need from a squad. Because some older players would sulk when an 18-year-old or a 17-year-old takes their position. And the players who were on the bench didn't do that. That's good signs for us. So I don't know how tomorrow goes. I don't know how Saturday goes. But, you know, we're going to do better than not with a lot of these young players in amongst sprinkled in that team. And we'll get our mojo. And we'll have a really good 2021. 
I don't care about Christmas. I think we're going to have a good 2021. The bones are there. The, the, the ingredients are there for something special that we're cooking. And myself and my partners, and credit to them because they're big into the academy, we've given the manager that freedom and belief that we don't care about anything but improving our young players and, mm-hmm. and playing good football. And some people say, oh, is he unsackable? He must be under pressure. We, of course, we want promotion. We want to win league titles. We want to win cups, do all of that. But first and foremost, we want to see improvement. We want to see good football. Yeah. And we've got the best manager for that. And even in the bad run, you know, I can have heart to hearts and hard talks with him. He's brilliant like that. You know, he doesn't take any of it personally. He doesn't think I'm digging him out. He takes that, you know, feedback really, really positively. Uh, and that's the biggest credit I can give to him because in the past, maybe I would have been impatient and I would have fucking, you sacked after a shit result or whatever. And I've done that and I've grown a little bit. So yeah, it was, it was, it was good. And, and to have the fans back now, 2000, it was really funny because there was 800 of them against in the EFL trophy on Tuesday night. And the booing every time West Ham had the ball was brilliant. <laughs> West, West Ham had like a 30 million pound winger playing. Because you're allowed to play like a couple of first team big boys in yeah, there. Yeah, under 21s if you want it, but you know, bring some others if you don't. Yeah, and then like Craig Dawson, who's like a well known centre back in the Premier yeah. League, our 17 year old centre back, I played him off the park. But it was interesting to see the big hitters and our fans booed them every time. And even 800 people, it sounded like 8,000 people. And then on Saturday, you know, Rochdale turned us around on the coin flip and we ended up playing with our fans mm-hmm. against scoring against with them, which worked in our favour because we won the half and the game. And you could hear those 2,000 fans again was amplified. It was the first time for years on a team sheet reading out of players' names, there was cheers consistently every team player. You know? it's like, it was, yeah, it was just, you know, it was great. And uh, it was just nice to have fans back. And obviously, I'm going to have a COVID run shortly. But, you know, that might not might not last because of the stupid fucking government overreach in this country and everywhere else, you know. But, yeah, it was good. So what did you have to go through to get the fans back in? You know, what went on behind the scenes to make that possible? Well, obviously, we had to pass a lot of safety checks. The safety officer had to work with the local authority, the safety authority. We had to make sure that, you know, you had the arrows in the right place, the seats were separated, that the right bubbles and people were coming in. Right down to I'm in my office and the girls who were working on the day, no food could be cooked on the day for anyone that was brought in. And I couldn't have an alcoholic drink. I don't drink anyone on match day. But one of the girls came in and said, oh, you got to put your own beer in your own fridge. You're not allowed anything from the boardroom. It's a 10 grand fine. People who were in the hospitality lounge where away directors were, if someone was in there on another table, you're not allowed to talk to each other. You know, all this kind of fucking nonsense. You know what I mean? And then obviously the outside, the minute your mask drops, someone's on you because obviously we know there are COVID officers like studying us. They studied us on Tuesday and we got like a, you know, report shortly afterwards and we passed all flying colors. And mm-hmm. and it's just, you know, poor Phil's got to read out three times during the game. This is, you know, to remind you to sit down, to remind you not to leave until you're allowed, you know. So look, all those hoops we had to jump through. But, you know, if we're going to jump through all those hoops, let us have football back and let us have more people back because there's probably no safer place to be than our stadium the last, like, Tuesday and Saturday mm-hmm. compared to being on a train or on an airplane, you know what I mean, or inside somewhere, you know. And uh, to see so many people with a smile on their face again, it gave them such a lift. And I think a lot of people need some sort of an emotional lift at the moment because this is just crushing the spirit. It's just, it's just never ending. Did you find, you know, the, the fans that took up the option to come in, was it, like, a certain demographic or... Uh, you know, was it younger fans or was there any rhyme or reason to it? No, I, I haven't studied the data on that, but I know a few of our older fans did come. And I know they were apprehensive at first. I've had messages since saying they've never felt safer. They thought it was brilliant. You know, they were, they were you know, uh, isolated in their own area. They, they, they didn't come into contact with batches of people. They could come in and out of the stadium safely, the facilities. Everything was run really well. And that's a credit to the staff, Dawn Britton, who, who runs, you know, with, with Sire, our safety officer. Everything was run really well, and kudos to our chief executive as well, because on Saturday, the game nearly didn't happen because we had a burst water pipe on Saturday morning. Our first game back in the league with fans, and, and I was getting a phone call that the game was going to get called off, and luckily, the local water board came around and they fixed the pipe, but there was no there was no fucking water in the whole stadium like early Saturday morning. So, you know, just what you need, another kick in the bollocks in 2020. One more thing. Uh, yeah. you, know, you know what, at that point, I probably would have handed the keys to the club <laughs> over. I'd have been just like, I'm done. I'm done. I'm really done. I mean, this year has really like put grey hairs on my head, but I'm done. I mean, it's just like, God bless. Um, but, you know, all's well that ends well. It was a really, really good day. It's great being back. I've been to the two games and seen two wins and, and enjoyed the football more than anything yeah. else. And I sound probably a bit of an oddball saying this, but to see the kiddies out there doing the business, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. It gets me very excited and... and 
you know, we've got some really, really good players in our club and the older players who are maybe lacking in confidence. And, you know, I, I, I have trusted them for a long time and maybe foolishly, but maybe they'll repay the trust now and they'll help those younger players step up and, and, and do the business. So I guess we'll find out. Sometimes we get too hung up on the, the, the number, like the age of somebody as well. That Oh, they're only 17. They can't, uh, they can't possibly make it. This is a man's game or whatever it may be. And then you see... You know, we've talked a little bit on the pod about uh, City. This young kid called Reece Staunton comes in, an 18-year-old. You know, best player on the park all season for us. Spot on. 18 years old. And, you know, kind of when he's playing, he transforms that defense. And when he's not, we look a shambles. And, you know, he's an 18-year-old, but he has the talent. So <laughs> the age doesn't matter. Age is the number. I was I was looking at Harry Kane yesterday thinking you know, he's 28 now. But the way he plays, his game is not based on pace. He's probably going to be like sharing him where he'll play to the 38. You know, because of his brain, the quickness of his brain and whatever else. And and you could be 17 or 38 and you could still have a career at the top or in the business. And um, as long as your young players keep their feet on the floor, as long as they realize they're going to come in and they're going to come out, as long as fans realize and we as owners have to realize you can't burn them out. You play them too much, you can hurt them and you have to blood them and you have to be a little bit patient with them as well because they're going to give you some great performances and they're probably going to give you some shit performances. And that's just that's young people. Young people are going to make bloody mistakes and they have to be allowed to make mistakes and they have to learn from it. If they don't learn from the mistakes, well, then, okay, you've got a call to make and then are they good enough? So, you know, there are all those key things that, that go in there with it. But look, so far, so good. And, and long may that continue. I want to talk a little bit about the EFL trophy. So, you know, the game last week was against West Ham on the 21s. And, sure. you know, I looked at some of the data and you've got 16 academies that were invited, seven made it to round two. You've got one left in round three. Mm -hmm. Is there really any benefit for the academies of being in the EFL trophy? Well, I obviously gave it a benefit for us. And if we were a championship club, I would try and enter us in it. So that our academy keeps getting to, to blood youngsters. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we, we had youngsters last year at 16 scoring their debuts and it bloods them. It gives them men's football and it allowed our managers to see them and, and have trust in them to play in the league game. So for a big Premier League club, look, we've beaten Arsenal, we've beaten Chelsea, we've beaten West Ham. Uh, who else? Well, we've beaten four or five of them now. And their budgets are like one player's wages yeah. is probably more than our entire younger team that played. There is a benefit um, that they play real football. And there is a benefit that shows that under 21 football in Premier League standard is crap. Mm -hmm. There's no kicking. There's no, you know, it's all technical. It's, it's, it's crap. The real football for young players in the Premier League to get real football is, is the EFL. And that's where I've always argued about the loan system sucks where Premier League clubs make silly demands on you and want silly wages paid, when really the benefit is for them, more so than you. And if I had a Premier League club, I would not want any of my players playing in the PL2 or the Premier League Academy Under-21 League. I would want all 20, 30 of them out on loan. Mm -hmm. I would almost, I would pay clubs to have my youngsters on loan, as long as they get 40, 50 games a year. Because I just think the, the benefit to them of playing men's football is just like, it's unbelievable. And, and, West Ham had some really talented young players, but they need to play another 20, 30 games like that. And if they played another 20, 30 games against the Peter United of League One, those players would be so much better. Yeah. And you can also see in some of the style of football that they overplay. You know, like we caught them a few times because they overplay, overplay, overplay. And again, you get that from playing academy football because the top coaches in Category 1, Category A are saying, pass, 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 pass the deck. Technical control. Yeah, correct. Instead of sometimes go direct. You know yeah. what I mean? Change it up. You know what I mean? Get a ball in behind. You know what I mean? It's it, it's just a different level. So I think the trophy is of massive benefit to Premier League clubs. People have always argued about it. Now oh, it's going to be lead to B teams. It won't lead to B teams. I think it's good for us because of the financial aspect of it. And it's good also because I can see our youngsters up against West Ham's youngsters. Mm -hmm. and with all due respect, our younger players outshone the West Ham younger players, which gives us confidence as a club that our academy is doing the right thing. And that's great, you know, because... Our under-18s won 6-0 last week. They lost at the weekend, but they went top of the league. You know, we've got another great batch underneath. We've got massive Premier League clubs. You know, today I'm turning offers down for a 15-year-old, you know, player who's just broke into the under-18 team. Who's already, we've got them down on a pre-pro deal, so they can't steal them anymore. But they're offering, you know, there was one club's already up to like 400 plus grand for them. And we're like, no. Mm -hmm. You know, because my partner, Jason, big into the academy, and Randy as well, they're supporting. And they're of the mind that those trees aren't grown yet. So why would you want to sell a quarter of the tree? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, kudos to them because that allows our club. Then they're to, in the best place. Yeah, allows our club to turn down those offers financially, whereas a lot of clubs couldn't do that. 
But the key is, there's no point in turning those deals down if that player doesn't end up getting in our first team in 18 months' time. And, that, and that's key to it working. So my job now in recruitment is, is blending the non-league, the gems, the lower league gems, now in with an influx of academy players. Mm-hmm. So I have to make all, with some experienced players, I have to make that work in my remit and make sure the pathway is there, which I did in the summer with Burroughs backing up Butler, with Canu backing up Ward. That was the decisions I made with the manager on the squad, which allows that pathway into the first team and Flynn Clark backing up a Schmodox in the broom. So that that's really key. You have to have a plan, otherwise your kids could get lost. Do you see a time where you have a team of under 21s? I mean, pick the number, but you know, it's just really one to 11. It's a young team. Or are you always going to be looking for those two or three kind of a spine of the team that's perhaps a little bit more experienced? So everyone would love to be a crew and crew are really brave because most of their players are produced and you couldn't give a credit to any club more than crew for doing that job. And it's worked for them the last few years, but David Artel has mm-hmm. been a brilliant manager. I think I can see in three, four years' time where 60%, 70% of our squad will be academy produced. I think in the coming couple of years, my job will be to make sure that if we're a championship team, we're going to need three, four, five championship-type players who are going to be on the big bucks. We're going to need our usual gems, the Ivan Tonys, the Dwight Gales that I'm going to find. And then we're going to have a batch of under-18s eight, under that have come from our academy in the squad. So it's making sure our manager is on board with that and making sure the recruitment's on board with that. And the other thing is, like last night, I'm, I'm looking to add two 17-year-olds from non-league. We'll join our academy to help the recruitment of our academy. So I'm also working on that. So there's a few new things I'm working on as well. And in fairness, my partners, the stuff they do has allowed me to go and do that and freed me up to maybe hopefully do my best work. So that will all marry up. It's going to take us a couple of years, a few years, but I'm trying to put the, the foundations in place that will all work together and blend mm-hmm. together. So who knows? Hopefully it'll take us where we need to go, you know, and we can punch above our weight. And instead of being that small little club, we can be like, maybe call us like a mini Southampton of yeah. the EFL. But yeah. Southampton produce and do such a great job in the Premier League, you know what I mean? So if we could do that and, and marry our, our whole recruitment uh, strategy together with the academy, we could be a really, really well-run football club very quickly. Yeah, and it's a virtuous circle, isn't it? Because you can get, then you will get your sales and then that will allow you to invest and it just continues to compound on each other. If it's done right, within three, four years, all debt to owners will be wiped out. We'll yeah. own our stadium cash-free. Our training ground will be twice as good as it is now. Our academy will be knocking on the door of Cat A instead of Cat B or Cat 2, Cat 1 and Cat 2. And yeah, we'll be, you know, we'll be able to have cheaper tickets for our fans. We'll be able to build our fan base. So that planning started probably a year ago and we're still putting energy into it. It'll take some time to come off, mm-hmm. but we'll be in a hopefully a healthy place. Obviously, the pandemic put paid to a lot of it. Um, you know what I mean? But that is my long-term goal is that the club owes the owners nothing. Yeah, it's It's self-sufficient. Yeah. It owns its own stadium. It has a great batch of young players and it's got three times as many fans at the moment who are paying a lot less. Those are the goals. Some lofty goals, I think, but I mean, why not? I say to my kids, Phil, you reach for the stars and sometimes you're going to fall short, but you know what? Falling short is going to be fucking fantastic. Mm-hmm. Getting to the stars is sensational. It took me a while to think like that in my business, but that's how we think as well. You know, you rather set some stretch, some, and I say stretch, but probably beyond stretch goals. And you, if you get anywhere close to them, you get a lot further than if you just settle for just, you know, business as usual. I've always been that way. I've never yeah. changed in my thinking. I don't know where I'm probably from my dad. My dad's always been that kind of flamboyant fucking go big or go home character. So I probably learned that from him. I'm hoping my kids do the same because mm-hmm. I don't want to settle for mediocrity. And I don't think anyone should. And I think everyone has talent within them. No matter what you are, who you are, what your mental state of mind is, if you're low, if you're high, everyone has some sensational talent within. And you have to find it and get it out of yourself. Moving kind of across, well, I guess it's down to League Two. We've had some firings. Um, We've had David Dunn uh, lose his job at Barrow. Yep. Um, we've had Tobias Phoenix actually not really sure the role that he was at Bolton but he's mm. seems like he's left and of course my uh, beloved city let Stuart McCall go did you want him to go? I don't think so and somebody might look at that to say that's an emotional decision rather than a you know a practical decision you know we were or we are third bottom and we've been awful this season really we've, we've been pretty poor and you're in an awful run yeah, I mean, we've lost six in a row. I think we've won two in 10, which was Southend and Tonbridge Angels. 
and we've not walked anywhere close to winning anything aside from that. You know, Stuart is obviously, a, you know, for those who know Forest City is a bit of a, it's a club legend, you know, at least for those who have been around the club since the 80s, you know, probably the 80s um, and late 90s. For those that weren't, you know, he doesn't necessarily have that cachet, so I can understand why they're calling for his head. He's too honest, uh, sometimes too open, too transparent. I think that probably got him into trouble talking about where the gaps are. What's his post-match interviews like after losing? Is he blaming the club, the board? Is he down? Is he dour? Is he, you know, I often, I haven't listened to any of his, but I listen to a lot of managers I put on lists. I like to hear what they're like when they lose, not when they win. He's usually the optimist. Okay. You know, he's usually somebody who will go in, he'll try and defend the, sometimes the undefendable. Okay. And he's very much a player's, I believe from the outside, a player's manager. You know, he doesn't want to throw anybody under the bus. Is he like a beaten dog at the moment in his interviews? Or is yes. He... So, you know, when you, um, the thing that he struggles with and has struggled with is he's great when you've got momentum and really like putting, uh, just accelerating the momentum. When you're in a slump, he finds it, uh, history has shown, he finds it difficult to turn a slump around. Look, it, it's like, it, here's, where, here's where I am with managers. It's really important. And it's, who motivates the motivator? Sometimes managers need to be lifted. You know, I've had previous managers say to me, I'm as low as a snake's belly. You know what I mean? My confidence or whatever. And I, ne- I never really understood what that saying meant. And even I will sometimes pull my manager out and say, I listened to your press conference today and you sound it down. Yeah. Uh, and he'd be like, really? And I was, yeah, you sounded a bit flat. So what's going on? What can I do to, to reinvigorate? Yeah. You know, and I did it recently with a guy. Do you know what I mean? He just sounded a bit. And I was just like, you just sounded a bit flat. That's not you. And, and sometimes it might be just a little kick they need as well and, and whatever. So because it's really important that, you know, and I say this in business as well, to the outside world, you have to show confidence. You have to show that you can fix things. You know, it's like you employ, you run a business and you stand up. I used to have Wednesday meetings in front of all my staff. I hired a cinema and every Wednesday they would traipse down from our office and there'd be 350 people in the auditorium. And then other people from the 19 countries where I had offices would ping in on TV screens. Mm -hmm. And I would stand on stage every Wednesday and speak for an hour. And if we had a great month or a shit month, you wouldn't know any difference with me because it would all be about motivating the people in that auditorium and the people on, on video and talking about the successes and talking about planning and talking about what's next and talking about what we've got to do to get to the top and talking about my dreams, and my aspirations. And, you know, I might be having the worst run personally, but I can't show that to the outside. It's probably why I'm a good poker player. You have to play the game. And I've said this before. And it's very difficult for a manager who loses six games in a row and probably knows he's getting a sack. Mm-hmm. So it's almost where they're getting to the point where they're looking for a bit of sympathy. And it's tough for me to teach them how to soak eggs. So, but I, I feel for Stuart and, and, you know, hopefully he'll go on and manage somewhere else. I think he got to that point, you know, where he was talking about, you know, starting to lament some of the recruitment in the summer and looking back at decisions that were made that were bad and, you know, mm. almost started to talk about situations, you know, which are probably best behind closed doors. But he was like, you know, wanting to justify, I think, but stopped himself dead, from doing dead it. Dead man walking when you start talking like that. Yeah. So it's a matter of time and... You know, we move on and I'm not sure who we move on to. I mean, that's the $64,000 question is, you know, you're in that situation. What kind of manager do you go for? Do you go for somebody who's a short term, let's just get you out of trouble, knows how to bring some folks in quickly? Or do you look at this as a project? You're in a dogfight down there. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's a different level, different league. So yeah, it's the next one is the key one because you cannot get the next one wrong. Right. You get get it wrong, it's non-league, which is unthinkable for Bradford and a club that size. So again, I'm not the owner. I don't know what the policy is. I don't know what's available. It's really difficult because, if, you know, of course I could say to you, like, go for a, a young aspirational manager. I would tell them this is a project, tell them, I want, you know, I want to get up the table. And then the next two years, I want back-to-back promotions. And I start putting those building blocks in place. Mm-hmm. But I'm going to back that up by saying to the manager, we're going to buy this player and that player and that player and the best fucking young players. And I'm going to bankroll it. Well, if the owner isn't going to bankroll that, who's he going to attract? It's really, really difficult. So I, I can't answer that question because I don't run that club. I don't know the yeah. circumstances, but they definitely probably need, if you're telling me they're as bad as they are and you think there's a danger they could get down, then they need a firefighter. Yeah. If you're telling me that the squad actually with a better manager or a more inspirational manager could start climbing and it's not all about January signings to rescue the situation, well, then you go after a longer term project. Yeah. So th- there is the choice for the new CEO and the owner. But really, they need to come out and, and put their flag in the sand and tell people 
this is what we want as a club or we're in trouble and mm. we're going to have to do this or you know sometimes you have to be honest you have to be honest with your fan base and and I said this to you before with Bradford but I would say to Bradford you've played the cheapest season tickets for a long time mm-hmm. if I ran your club I would say that stops yeah because my job now is to deliver champagne football mm-hmm. champagne players and you're going to have to pay a bit more for that yeah, and, and this is the ride, and the fans are probably at first going, mm, but then they go, okay, let's give this a try. There'd be very few fans that you come across that would turn their nose up at that. I think that Correct. cheap tickets was fantastic when it was introduced and it really made a difference yeah. to Valley Parade. And we were at a point when we really needed to bring kind of something back, and it was yeah. a great initiative. But you know, as a result, the club is uh, again, as an outsider looking in, appears to be continually underfunded. Correct. Um, I mean, there was a period when we spent too much money. Badly, badly. Yes, yeah, so we spent money and we got relegated for having, despite having the biggest wage bill in 15 years. Yeah. yeah. And and that comes from, there's not a lot of money coming in through the gate. Correct. And that's where you're transparent and honest with your fan base. You know, Houston, we have an issue. This is what we need to do to fix it. And if that doesn't work, I'll again put my hands up and say that didn't work. But I'm going to be honest. There's lots of things I do to piss my fan base off. Yeah. None of us are perfect, you know what I mean? But the one thing I won't do, and, and my partner said, so you don't hide from a situation. God bless my partner, Randy, has been handling so many fans on Twitter. He's put himself out there all the time to answer about questions, the options, the season tickets, and he's, he's, he's done it brilliantly. Very proud of him, the job he's done, because it was tough. He was just getting hammered left, right, and center. And, you know, sometimes as owners, you've got to be brave. And credit to my other partner, Jason, who when we lose, he will come out and he will, you know, tweet, just like he'll tweet when we win. And, you, you know, you have to be that way. And I, I took the decision to come off social media on weekends, not because I was hiding. I would answer good and bad, but probably because I would be too cutting with some of the people who were like coming at me because that's my character. You get emotional. I get emotional. And I thought, you know, instead of hiring hitmen to go around and take out a load of social media trolls, it's better I come <laughs> off until Monday. And then Monday, I'll, I'll reassess good or bad, I come out on Monday. So I've always been that way um, recently. So I don't know where Bradford goes next, Phil. It's concerning. I can see you're, you're a little bit, you know, washed out in the face with it, you know, talking about it. I will say this to you. It won't always be like this. No, we've talked a lot about cycles. I mean, I still believe in cycles. Uh, for us, it's all about recruitment in January for sure. You know, we had poor recruitment from an old owner three years ago when we were signed a lot of long-term contracts. Yeah. And we'd historically been a club that only offered one, two-year deals. And we started throwing around three-year deals and probably not to the right people. Big three-year deals you threw around. That's the problem. Big three-year deals. Now you've got players on, um, you know, pre-salary cap, big deals for League One at the bottom of League Two. And so no one's going to take those off your hands. And, you know, frankly, Stuart and, um, didn't fill the gaps well enough. And I think yeah. that's his downfall. Look, he has to take responsibility. He took the job. Uh, a club like Bradford shouldn't be in the bottom three of League Two, regardless of how fucked up things might be above. Mm-hmm. There's no way they should be there. So he's going to have to take that criticism and take it on the chin. And uh, hopefully the next manager comes in, you'll get that immediate bump. Yeah. Because football players drive you mad. You fire the manager, usually you're guaranteed two or three wins. So don't be surprised if Bradford win the next two or three games. Well, hopefully we got Crawley away tomorrow. So we'll know by the time this goes out what is cool. happening with that one. Here we go. So moving off City, because I could talk about that for the next, or I could lament about that for the next hour or so. We have Trevor Birch, who's been appointed head of the EFL, replacing Dave Baldwin. And I just wonder if you have any experience or background with Trevor. Never met him, never talked to him. So, you know, hopefully it's a good appointment. What have we got to lose? Um, you know, it's, it's, we're at a time in EFL now where we need a lot of things to go right. We need some really, really good leadership. You know, there's so many problems I've been speaking to you before off air. Um, so hopefully we can put all a lot of things right and go into the new era and the next TV deals and hopefully Trevor is a good leader. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think it's a good appointment. Time will tell. He's very experienced. He's very, very well connected. And he's been in football a long time. Um, so, yeah, kudos to them for getting that one in. And uh, wow, I don't envy the job he has. <laughs> it's going to be a tough one. Mm-hmm. But uh, good luck because, you know, there's so much that needs uh, uh, sorting out in the EFL, big time. And I wanted to ask, so we had the news this morning of Gerard Houllier passing away. And, you know, as a Liverpool fan, I just wondered if you had any memories of uh, Gerard as manager. I loved Houllier when I was younger. When we won the treble that year, we won the FA Cup, the League Cup and the UEFA Cup. And I remember I was living in Spain at the time watching and, and I watched all those games. And we were never quite good enough to compete for the league title. But the one thing Julier brought to us was some great young French players. 
we won a lot of trophies uh, and it was a successful period. You know, I love an FA Cup, even a League Cup. You know, it was just that that tr- that treble. You know, Gary McAllister was one of the best fucking veteran signings ever back then. So I think he changed the academy, the philosophy. I think so many things he did were the building blocks for the foundation for Benito to come in and then obviously after him. Um, yeah, very sad. He was 73. God bless him. I don't know. I don't think he was well. Um, I, I saw the news just before I actually came on to do the podcast. So um, I know he had heart attacks and everything yeah. else when he was the manager. So, yeah, God, God bless him and may he rest in peace. Another another legend, an icon of football lost. Now, as before we go into the break and a couple of listener questions, you, you teased earlier about, uh, you know, your frustrations with what's happening in the UK with our, our good friend COVID and tier three. Ah. So this is something that I didn't know about because, um, you know, being in the States and I think it may just have happened before we record. So what's the latest state of affairs? Yeah, so they're basically on tier three London and, you know, restaurants now will have to close. Now, you, you know, you feel for these businesses at Christmas where you finally got some business coming in at Christmas and now you're going to have to cancel it all. And it's just constant fucking overreach from governments everywhere. You know, tier system instead of lockdowns, which then lead to more lockdowns. And once Christmas finishes, they're going to lock everyone up here again in the UK. And it's really frustrating because, and I've said this before, everyone knows the data, the statistics, we all know. You got Cam, the mayor of London, going on about all the risks to school children and shut the schools. And I thought I was screaming, like, what risks to children in schools? We all know the data now. You can't hide that shit from us anymore. And there's no way anyone over 60 should be working in a school, right? Until they're vaccinated. So mm-hmm. why should schools be risky? Everybody keeps screaming at me, going, yeah, but you're going to infect older people. Fuck off. I've been wearing a mask for eight months. I don't believe in them, but I wear them. Every time I see an older person come near me, I was in a hotel today in a business meeting, and I walk about 10 feet away. I do my bit. Mm-hmm. But again, I'm in a supermarket with my wife on the high street in Weybridge the other day, and there's an 82-year-old man in Sainsbury's with not a mask on. All right, and, and he's the man who could get ill, end up in hospital, yeah. another number for the NHS, another number for the media to go crazy about. And everyone else's lives, forget all the deaths and the poor people who've died from this that we didn't protect. But what about the livelihoods and the businesses? This is, the UK is done here. I mean, if they go into another lockdown after these tier systems and Christmas passes, I'm looking at it and go, me and my wife did it ever saying, what comes next? You know, health clubs, gyms will go, you know, uh, hairdressers, nail salons are going to go, restaurants are already going to go, they're on their arse, cinemas are gone. You start going through the industries that are not coming back and who are going to go. Weybridge, uh, Walton Thames, where I am. I've been there twice now in the high street and stuff like that. Phil, it's desolate. It's horrible. Half of the premises are boarded up. They're empty. The, the streets are quiet. To people out there, and this is a message because I'm moving on in 2021. If you are in that camp right now where you push lockdowns, you want more lockdowns, you're in the press, and I, I, they can burn in hell for all I care every time they talk about lockdowns because none of them lost their jobs. None of them had to, you know what I mean, not work when they were kept locked up months ago. If you're a young person under the age of 45 and you've got more chance of dying of fucking sunstroke than COVID and you're out there screaming for lockdowns and you don't employ anyone, you don't have a business, get off my uh, calendar and my, my index. I've got no interest in being friends with anyone who's team apocalypse. I'm looking at 2021 and going, if you're in that camp, and you want lockdowns and you want to keep destroying businesses and you don't have a business because that's usually people who scream in that way. They don't employ people like I do over here in the UK. Yeah. Uh, I don't want you in my life anymore. I'm team reality. I study data. I speak to the medics in charge and football and everything else. I know the risks. I don't go near old people. I very rarely spend time with people over the age of 60. And if I do, I'm miles away from them. So I am living responsibly. I'm wearing my mask as I travel. But if you are in that camp, I don't want to fucking know you anymore. If you believe what the governments are doing in all these different countries, whether it be in Ireland, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, places in America, thankfully not in Florida, who are going down that route, fuck you. I've got no time for you whatsoever. I look at California, who've been locked up pretty much for eight months. Florida's been open for eight months. Mm-hmm. And difference in the statistics, you know, per infections per thousand, deaths per thousand, Florida's like behind them. So again, I think the science we keep getting told to follow, have a look at a a place like Florida that's wide open with such an older population. You know, we have the vaccine now, shield the vulnerable until they take the vaccine, let everyone else get on with it because what you're doing economically, Phil, you've no idea what's coming here in the UK. You haven't even been home to Bradford and where you live nearby. No, I haven't been able to travel this year at all. I would hate to see the high streets, the shops, the amount of big companies that are going to go bust and the unemployment that's going to follow in like February and March. It's, it's, it's just, it's horrible. And I'm so fed up with the government overreach and enough's enough now. They need to get rid of the guy in charge here. Someone needs to come in and go, look, guys, we're going to be honest with you. It's all systems to the pump to get the vaccine to the people who need it. Yeah. 
we need to get everyone over 60 vaccinated. We need people who work in healthcare in the front lines vaccinated. We need people who work in care homes vaccinated as well as the patients, because take that out of the equation, hospitalizations will drop off. Mm -hmm. Mortality will drop to very, very little. And then the press can't write and talk about it to scaremonger people anymore. And that's the fact. And anyone who wants to argue that with me, anyone who disagrees, unfollow. Don't listen to the podcast because I couldn't give a fuck about your opinion anymore. What this has done this year to our children, our businesses, our livelihoods. I'm sorry. I'm watching my football club for eight, nine months fighting. I've got gray hairs from keeping it going with my partners. The things I've had to do, furloughing employees, no income. We've lost millions because of it. We got 400 grand bailout and we lost millions. The government's bailed out other industries. They've left us behind. I feel like starting a legal action with other football clubs and sue the government for access to a bailout or a loan because everyone else has had it and we haven't. And our price so far is 400 grand for us not being able to operate. We're allowed back fans for one league game and it could be taken away from us again this week. Hey, we can operate as a business like this. That's the hardest thing. Is Phil, they don't care. You can't plan for care. next week. You've got to plan as if it's going ahead. You've got to invest all the money it takes to put that game on and then on Friday you could be told. Sorry. We, we, we've committed thousands for this weekend. We've committed probably 15 grand for security and stewards for Saturday and on Friday we could be told no game. Mm -hmm. And I just, we can't operate and run a business like this. Our employees are on tender hooks. There are people furloughed, unfurloughed, semi-furloughed, um, don't know if they're going to lose jobs. Um, you know, did, did the government's done this? Yes, there's a pandemic. Yes, it's horrible. Yes, we know what it's done to people. We know people have lost their lives, but this has decimated businesses. This has decimated a large percentage of the population who've got no chance ever of suffering from COVID. And again, stay away from people who are in that percentage chance of passing from COVID or having issues. And I'm one of those. I don't want to be around someone who could potentially get it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's just who I am. Um, you know, I, I'll give you an example. I could go to the MK Dons game tomorrow. I'm not going because I got told someone I stood three feet from potentially could have COVID from Saturday. Mm -hmm. And they're going for a test and I'm waiting for their test to come back. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to go to the game tomorrow because I know I could be around older people in the MK Don's director's box. So I'm doing my bit. Personal responsibility. Yeah, it's my responsibility. And, I, and I'm doing the right thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and we're taking those freedoms and choices away from people doing the right thing. And we're just like drilling them with rules whilst we're taking their businesses and livelihoods away. It's horrendous to watch. And I just cannot believe our civilization, our populations are allowing this to go on. I read the other day. I don't know if this is true. Up to fifteen hundred people a day are getting on are, are not diagnosed with cancer here right. in the UK. Did you know that? I didn't know the number, but it doesn't surprise me. That's true. That's forty odd thousand people a month. Yeah, people are staying out of uh, hospitals and doctors and everything because they're afraid to go. Yeah, so we we could be losing thousands and thousands of younger people from like life threatening diseases. Yeah. Because of the scaremongering that's gone on and the and and not having access to the hospital and keep wanting to protect the NHS and overflowing in hospitals when we've had eight months to make sure these hospitals were prepped for this. I just for the life of me don't understand why people still agree with this. I don't get it. I don't get why the media is still agreeing with it. I don't get why anyone would agree with this. Bar someone who's maybe sat on the couch getting paid to stay at home who doesn't really have any skin in the game. The skin in the game of life, you know, where they leave their house and there's a few of them out there probably a few of them follow me so fucking don't anymore um but yeah i'm, I'm getting rid of people like that I've, I've got no interest now if you're on that side and it is sides there's no in the middle you're either team reality your team apocalypse for me so you better make your mind up quick phil otherwise this podcast could come to an end <laughs> i'll get my coat no <laughs> no in, in reality i think you know we both know because we've talked about it you know when you think back in march when we didn't know what we didn't know Different. we were very um we were very careful and not to say we're not careful now, but that personal responsibility is key. I mean, where we believe that if you like last night, we, we went to the high street, there's a local um, theater here that's running um, your Christmas movies for the kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we went, you know, and everyone's distanced and distance between rogue. We want to support the local community. So we're going and doing stuff. We're just being careful and trying to protect ourselves the best we can. That's kind your of your team reality. Yeah. Well done. All right. I'll put my coat back. Yeah, hey, you don't agree with lockdowns, <laughs> do you? You don't no. agree with lockdowns. I, the first first time round, maybe. Second time, yeah. yeah I mean, we yeah. we know, like we've talked about off mic. We got family in Southern California who have rest who work in restaurants, yep. who you know get shut down the day before Thanksgiving after they bought all their food, and it's the same's happening by the sounds of it in London. Everyone's bought their food for Christmas, yep. and nobody's helping them out. No, it's outrageous. It's outrageous. So welcome to Team Reality.
And, and I would say to you, cleanse anyone in your life is Team Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so this is the way it's got to go. But no, you know, all seriousness, you know what? This can't go on. We now have vaccines. We shouldn't be talking anymore about tears and lockdowns. We should just be talking about how do we get everyone that needs the vaccine. I said to my dad last week, my dad's 70, said to my sisters, ring up his GP, his doctor, and find out how we get him on the list for the vaccine because he's obviously got asthma. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the sooner we can get him the vaccine, the better. You know, because I haven't given my dad a proper hug for like nine, ten months. Right. And, and you know, I've done the right thing. And But he's free to live his life the way he wants to. And he's with his lovely young girlfriend in, in Atlanta at the moment, for away for a few days enjoying himself. And that's fine, but that's his choice. He's not asking for businesses to be shut down and lockdowns to happen mm -hmm. because, you know, of, of the, the dangers of the virus for him. But I do want to get him the vaccine. And that's got to be all our key now is just let's get people. And I include teachers in that. Let's get teachers the vaccines so that infections don't go through schools and kids have to quarantine for two weeks. Let's get everyone that matters the vaccine straight off the bat. What are we waiting for? Anyway, let's go to a break. That's my rant on COVID. I'm not going to change. Come at me all you want. Go fuck yourself. All right? This cannot continue to happen. And on that note, we'll take a little break and we'll be back with some listener questions in a moment. Hey everybody, welcome back. We've got some listener questions we're going to get into. We'll see if we get through all of them in the time that we got left today. But I'm going to start with Martin. And Martin is a concerned Celtic fan. Okay. You know, he was talking he's talking about Neil Lennon and how things have really turned uh, from being serial winners into, and this is Martin's term, a, a complete basket case on the pitch. Maybe a little bit harsh, but I think that things, you know, when you're used to winning, yeah. um, I'm sure it's uh, been a tough season so far. Uh, he says the club and the supporters seem to be miles off each other at the moment. And a lot of that is due to, in his eyes, the management and coaching structure. My question is, could the CEO and majority shareholder sacrifice any chance of 10 in a row just as a show of defiance to the fans uh, so they're not shown to be acting to fan pressure? Do you think there's anything in terms of, hey, the fans think this and I'm not going to do it because the fans think it? Look, I'm a Celtic fan, so I've always looked out for the results, always have been. You're either Celtic or Rangers, where I come from, so... And fair play to Stephen Jerry, he's really got it together. You know, Rangers, the, the, the run they've been on. It's turned toxic, obviously, very much so. I'm very mm -hmm. surprised Lennon still has a job because they're, they're on a horrendous run. They're not going to win the title. There is no 10 in a row. And they're pretty much out of, you know, the cup competitions in Europe and everything else. So you're either sticking or shifting for a while. And I know the board have put out, you know, we're behind the manager, we're behind the manager. I'm not sure how long that can continue if you keep losing. The Celtic fan base are like passionate as fuck. And they're probably very lucky there ain't 50,000 people in that stadium at the moment because it would probably get even worse. So, look, Lenny's okay. You know, you'd like them to turn it around. I'm not sure they're going to with him. Time will tell. We lost our number two to Celtic. He, you know, they recruited him as a coach in the summer, Gavin Strachan. So, I'd want them to do well because of him. I wouldn't want him to lose his job. But a club that size, I would imagine, you know, they might leave it till the end of the season. And obviously, Rangers win the title, and then it's a reset time when they'll probably bring in a, a young manager or whatever else mm -hmm. and reset it all and go a different way. So, But what a job that is for anyone to get. I read the other day about Martin O'Neill going back in there. I don't think that's what the answer is. Right. You know, Rangers have pressed the reset button with a young manager who they probably won't keep for very long if he keeps doing what he's doing. Mm -hmm. So that was the, that's the right template. Celtic have done phenomenal to do nine in a row or, you know, to, to get where they went to. So, actually, 10 in a row. So to, to kick on, you know, you're probably going to find in the summer they might make the change. Now, if they continue losing, it'll come sooner. When you're looking at replacing a manager, do you off, do you sometimes think, I'm just going to sit somebody in there for the rest of the season? Like, I know this season's done. It's probably not going to get any worse than it already is. But maybe the person I want isn't available or there's something that isn't quite right. And I'm just going to get essentially a, a long-term caretaker in the job. It's always a dangerous thing, the caretaker thing. I went down at once with our youth coach in, and then he ended up winning too many games. I'd given the job, and I, I'd never had full belief he was the man for the job. Mm -hmm. It would be wrong if I hadn't given him the job. So I had Grant McCann a couple of times take over and steer the ship for a few games and then gave him the job. And look, he was a good appointment, but it didn't work out for various reasons. But I'm not sure. I don't run a club the size of Celtic. Yeah. Um, I'm not their owner, even though I think he's Irish. Um, so it's interesting to see what, for me personally, it would be now. I would be like, you know, while it continues, put the assistant in for four or five results and go out and recruit a new manager and give them maybe the last 10, 12 results of the season to find out more about a squad. Yeah. So then in the summer, we can put our recruitment campaign together based on his real thoughts from being involved day to day. Yeah. All right. Well, I got a question from Paul. Paul says, Posh recently switched from Nike to Puma. Yep. How do you attract such heavyweight kick manufacturers given 
their relatively small stature in the game, and no offense intended, I think Paul's a posh fan sure. saying that, is the move to uh, somebody like Puma from a Nike more lucrative? I've always been a brand guy. And when I yeah. first bought Posh or a brand, I forget what it was, but it was shit. And I was always of that, you know, who are your brands? You're, I'm a big Nike fan, so you're Nike, mm -hmm. and my kids love Adidas. Yeah. Um, you know, you want to go after your big brands. So I pushed heavily for us to get Adidas and Nike back in the day. With that comes its own issues as well, because you're dealing with massive suppliers who don't really, their attention span for League One football clubs isn't massive. Mm -hmm. So you don't get great credit terms. You don't get front of stock. You don't get the little things the big clubs get. Yeah. So Alex, our commercial manager, worked with, uh, I believe it was Jason and Randy, on the deal for the current uh, change, the Puma. And the gear, I like the gear. Mm -hmm. I like the gear they've done for us. So yes, there was, it was better financially for us. And, and that's credit to our commercial team for doing that for us. So it, it's not impossible for any football club to go out and get a good deal. You've yeah. got to go ask the question. Like when I came in, our shirt sponsors were paying like 20 grand a year for the front of the shirt. Mm -hmm. I bought them out. I paid mm -hmm. them off because I knew our front of the shirt was what I was about to bring to town was going to get a bigger sponsor yep. and now we get now we get six figures to the front of yeah. our shirt it's one of the biggest deals probably in league one so you know bar your sunderland so there's no glass roof on anything you want to do whether it's getting a different kit person in whether it's getting a better sponsorship deal we had one of the first naming rights in league one you know of everyone mm -hmm. and we went out and did it because it was something i believed in should happen if you believe it should happen you put it into practice and you back your people and give them the confidence they can go out and do it yeah one of the things i remember we used to have nike uh, for a few years and there's a lot of pushback in terms of you don't really get that much flexibility in kit template design for example it's like these are the six stock templates stick your colors into those and if you don't like it then you can lump it yeah and, and your credit terms are pretty limited you get like yeah. 60 days or you get like 100 grand's worth of whatever else so you get 50 grand's worth of free kits so that's up to your commercial department to push the needle and get mm -hmm. you better and we did better with puma and Puma has been a very, very good partner so far. So I got a question from Zach. Zach says he's a Leeds fan, and he was just wondering if you had ever had to sack a manager. We're talking a lot about sacking managers today, it seems. Oh. <laughs> uh, if you'd ever had to sack a manager, even though you thought he was a brilliant manager, but the results were just too bad that he, you know you couldn't take it anymore. Yeah, my current gaffer twice. Yeah. So I always thought he was a brilliant manager. First time I sacked him, we had a fallout. Second time I sacked him, and I shouldn't have. I should have sacked the players. So yes to that answer. I, I've sacked, you know, I thought Mark Cooper was a good manager, but it was too soon for him. He came mm -hmm. from Kettering and non-league to us in the championship. But I saw something in him that I thought he's got talent. And he went on then, and he did brilliant at Swindon, and he's done really well at Forest Green. Yeah. And I think he, he has an expansive mind. And we fell out because he never forgave me for when I fired, for when I fired him. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think his family forgave me either. And when you're a young manager, sometimes you have to let that shit go. So... You know, there have been some managers, yes, I've fired, and I thought, you're really talented, but it's just not for me at that moment in time. And so there's a follow-up question, and current manager accepted, you know, which of those former managers that you have fired, um, and you may have already answered it, uh, do you think has come on the furthest since they left Peterborough? Graham McCann has done brilliant. I think, you know, he, he, he found himself, he's found his aggressive side he needed to find at Doncaster. He got them in the playoffs. I think the training he had with me, you know, really, really prepared him for that. He then got a great job with Hull in really difficult circumstances. Mm -hmm. He's been relegated. They've allowed him the time to rebuild, and they're the top of our league. So credit to Grant. Um, you know, he's done. It. I, I've always said he'd make a really, really good manager, and I still believe that. And his family were probably salty about you know me firing him and the way it happened. He's probably very salty about it still. But I have a lot of time for him. I'll give Steve Evans a lot of credit. He's that one manager that texts me every few days still. Mm -hmm. uh, there was you know at first it was he was very angry and then he got over the anger and he realized you know what i mean that we just didn't work he respects me a lot and he texts me every few days yeah. and him and his family i wish nothing but the best and and you know i have a lot of time for steve it just didn't work between us mm -hmm. so you're not going to get on with every manager you know that you sacked you know graham wesley i've gone out and i've had you know lunch with after i fired him so we we we, we mended fences there's a couple i haven't really spoken to i didn't speak to gary johnson again i haven't spoke to Mark Cooper ever again. I've emailed with Jim Gannon. It's a very small industry. Yeah. There's no point in having grudges and issues with each other when you move on. Because as Barry Fry said to our manager now, and every manager that's come in, when you're a new young manager in football, the one thing you're guaranteed is you're going to get sacked in football. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. and it happens to most good young managers. It's just part of the process.
<laughs> last question that we have in which is from jack and jack is a, a posh fan who's got a little bit of a grumble about the pitch not so much the football he says he's been loving the football but uh, what's happened to the pitch and just wondering if there's anything specific that you know you can do to fix it we've had 12 home games in like nine months on it it's a disgrace and i had uh, trust me i hadn't seen it that bad and i got involved and i've had all the pitch company in today uh, we spent a lot of money on two pitches, one at the training ground, one at the main ground. We were told spending that money with the maintenance on it and everything else, we would have unbelievable pitch every year for X amount of years. Yeah. And I think we're year two or year three in it now, and it's a fucking disgrace. They blamed it on the rain and excess rain during the week, and there was a lot of rain. But there's no way it should be in that condition. It shouldn't mm-hmm. be putting up to that stage where it's at. So that pitch company has been in my wrath at the moment, and that needs to be fucking fixed. Otherwise, I'll be going after them for brand new pitch. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Because that's not what was promised. So trust me, I know the way we play football, we need a better pitch. But that can't be an excuse either for us not winning football games as much as your pitch was shit on Saturday and we play great football. But we have to fix it quick. And let's go. We've got a, I put it in the business question section. Um, I think it's more kind of general advice. Um, we have an anonymous email that came in and, and apologies to the person who wrote it. It came in two or three weeks ago, but we just haven't had the opportunity to ask a question. Um, and, you know, he's in a difficult kind of career uh, uh, situation from taking a job, uh, his current employer finding out, uh, I think it didn't go down too well, maybe getting fired and in a, a position where he's in a worse spot than when he started out. And really the question related to that, I, I gave that just for some context, but the question can be really related, related to anybody. And that's, um, and it's, it seems apt given again the sackings and firings and all those things we've been talking about but do you have any advice to people on picking themselves off the floor after they've been fired from a job so he basically was looking elsewhere for a job during his current job and he got fucking binned if your wife went out on a date tonight and you found out about it tomorrow how would you feel yeah not good right so you probably want to listen i've been my wife all there would be no forgiveness she knows that i'm that type of guy so when i ran my business i was ruthless in the way of I demanded loyalty. Yeah. I worked my people hard, but they got paid well. And I demanded loyalty. And if I found out for one minute that they were basically entertaining other jobs or talking to other people, I'll give you a, I'll give you a story. I went to my sister's wedding and it was around, I want to say it was 07, 08. I can't remember quite when it was. And the shit was about to hit the fan economically and financially in the world. And a big developer in Dubai had begged me to go and open in Dubai. We were selling mm-hmm. in 19 countries. And I, I just didn't fancy Dubai. It was something I was worried about Dubai. And this developer had come to me, offered us so much money. You've got to open in Dubai. We want your client flow and your staff. And we had like brilliant marketing staff. While I went to my sister's wedding, this developer from Dubai flew to Spain and interviewed 75 of my top people for jobs. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it, it started with three or four who then started with others. And of course, look, you could say it's my fault, but why, why would your wife go on another date if she's happy? But, you know, typical Dubai offering like ridiculous riches. These people were already earning fucking thousands per week. So when I found out, I, I, I got off my jet in Ireland for the wedding and I got a phone call, a tip off, and I found out. And when I got back on the Monday, it was like that scene out of uh, Game of Thrones, the Red Wedding. Basically, like I, I cleaned out about mm-hmm. 50 of my, my top people, went in one, one fucking sitting. I went down, I got them all in a room. When they all started looking at each other, they knew the similarity that they'd been in another interview room a few days before, and they were, they were in my room, and they were gone. And they were out of my life, and I wouldn't speak to them again. Mm-hmm. Now, if someone comes to me and says, I'm unhappy, and I need to look for a job elsewhere, and I really valued them, I would work to try and keep them and make them happy before they start looking. So I would always say to someone, just be very careful about looking for a job. If you're going to go down that route, go to your boss and tell them you're unhappy. There's a reason you're unhappy. Ask them to hear you out. What's the worst that you can hear? Get back to your desk, get back to work. Mm. You know, just, just be honest about it. So I, I always have an open door policy. Just as we're doing the podcast, I've had an email off an employee about some issues they've got. And I'll answer that and I'll deal with that. And I, and I implore anyone to come forward with any issues they might have or they need to talk about. I've never been that person that was unapproachable. I've always been that approachable person. So, But if you're really unhappy in a job, get out of the job and go get another job. Yeah. Just be careful about you know going out and trying to get a job while you're in the job. I know that's easy to say, but you need to have your income before you go get another income. Just always be careful about having your head turned. It's The, the, the grass isn't always greener. And, you know, that that's saying we've all been in that position. Where we've done things and gone, fuck, I wish I didn't do that. Yeah, so, I've definitely done that with some job moves. Of course we have. And if this kid's on the floor who wrote in, I presume he's a youngster or whatever else, listen, get over it. You, you, you know, you'd be fine. Go find another job. 
And next time, don't always be googly eyed for everything that you don't have. Sometimes appreciate what you do have and see if you can improve on what you do have. Yeah, something I always encourage as well is don't necessarily, you know, you go and you've gone to look for something, you've not told your current employer, you've got a new job, you tell your employer you've got a new job and your employer comes back and says, okay, here's a package to keep you. Like Correct. my my encouragement is always never take those packages because you've already passed the point in no return. Yes. Um, and it's going to be a slippery slope from, you know, your, your numbers marked, whether you know it or not, or whether you feel it or not. And you're still going to be, the, the situation probably didn't change that made you look in the first place. For me, there's no forgiveness. Yeah. Whether it's my wife or my employee playing that, I've, you know, I, I it's probably why Darren and me had issues the, the first time around because he was flirting with other jobs, always in the press. Mm -hmm. And I felt I was coming from a certain area and I got my back up and I felt like, okay, you, do you want to go to another club? And I was young and impulsive. And again, like what happened with, I was saying in my real estate business, I kind of like, well, no, my ego can't take that. You know, why would you want another job? even though these were bigger clubs and they were offering me a million quid for a services. Do you know what I mean? So you just have to like, you know, like I said to you, look, grass isn't always greener. Sometimes appreciate what you do have. And particularly right now in this pandemic where so many people aren't going to have work, you know what, whatever work you're in, fuck me, you're lucky. Sit tight. Yeah. This is a time to sit tight and keep your nose clean. You're lucky. You're very, very lucky. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, let's wrap up. Um, I want to thank everybody for listening again this week. We'll be back same time, same place next Wednesday. Uh, hopefully chat more and hopefully we're uh, you're still out of tier three and uh, you've had some more fans back in the ground. Don't even bring up fucking tears, Philip. Otherwise, <laughs> we're gonna be, you're going to be on that other team and you're going to be cut. <laughs> I'll be back, in my, back getting my jacket again. <laughs> we'll see if I make it to next week. <laughs> we'll see you next week where it's going to be back to DMAC on his own doing a, doing a solo <laughs> on the podcast. All right? Take care, everyone out there. Stay safe. Thanks a lot, everybody.